good evening everybody it is my pleasant duty to welcome you all to today's unique event we have organized different programs in this hall like lectures on sky gazing screening of movies and of course our regular shows this is the first time we have a lecture by an eminent scientist followed by screening of an internationally acclaimed planetarium show on the same topic in which professor uguri has was deeply involved let me give a brief introduction of our activities to our distinguished guests jawaharlal nehru planetarium is engaged in dissemination of science through various programs we have popularization of programs aimed towards general public namely sky theater shows attracting over 250000 visitors every year programs like watching celestial events screening of science movies science exhibitions sky uh, sky watching attracting people in hundreds we have in depth non formal science education programs starting from school students to undergraduate students these students attend classes throughout the year our non formal programs have produced over 110 students who have pursued phd programs and are now involved in research or in teaching our association with icts has been very successful we have had over dozen public talks by distinguished scientists which have attracted a large number of science enthusiasts faculty at icts professor balayer dr vijay kumar dr vishal vasan are teaching in our reprograms i thank icts for today's initiative we are honored with the presence of today's speaker professor hiroshi uguri warm welcome to you sir we have another sp very special guest shrimati sudha murthy her association with the jnp dates back to over two decades i extend a very warm welcome to you madam hearty welcome to professor saraswati vishweshwara <laughs> professor reni borges and other distinguished guests in the audience i extend very warm welcome to all the guests and request professor rajesh gopukumar to say few words about icts and introduce the speaker thank you Uh, thank you dr pramod it's a pleasure as always to be at the planetarium and to be cooperating uh, with you on our outreach activities and but today's is a very special outreach activity as you it's a sort of a unique one as uh, dr pramod said uh, uh, so it's uh, a special pleasure to uh, welcome you all uh, for this scre screening come lecture in the evening uh, uh, this is part of the icts at 10 events which mark the 10 years of the existence of the international center for theoretical sciences uh, whose campus is in north bangalore near in hesargatta uh, and icts is a unique institution among the many scientific institutions in bangalore what sets icts apart is uh, that we not only do research in the frontier areas of theoretical physics mathematics quantitative biology and uh, uh, related topics in the pure sciences but we also organize uh, collaborative workshops and uh, pedagogical schools for researchers in a way we are a national facility uh, with uh, uh, interfacing the indian scientific community with the rest of the world and in addition we strongly believe in communicating science to the public uh, which is why uh, we have uh, several of these outreach events and uh, with the planetarium we have been having this very successful copy with curiosity series perhaps many of you have been uh, uh, for some of them uh, and uh, we also have other lectures and uh, maybe some of you were at the kipthorn lecture we had on thursday at the icts campus uh, uh, which was quite a phenomenal event uh, if you were there uh, if you weren't uh, we, our uh, the video of the talk is available on our website uh, as are all the other copy with curiosity and public lecture talks so uh, uh, so don't feel bad if you miss the event you can always watch it on youtube 
So tonight I have the special pleasure of introducing to you a colleague again of Kipton, uh, very coincidentally from Caltech. Uh, it's the distinguished physicist, uh, Professor Hiroshi Oguri, the, who is the Fred Kavli Professor of Physics, Theoretical Physics and Mathematics, uh, and also the director of the Walter Buck uh, Institute uh, for Theoretical Physics at Caltech. Professor Oguri is known uh, for many path-breaking works in string theory and often with an impact in pure mathematics as well. Uh, I've had the privilege of even collaborating with uh, Hiroshi on a paper uh, about a decade ago. Uh, he has been recognized for his uh, research in numerous ways. Uh, I won't mention all of them as a Simons investigator with the prestigious uh, Leonard Eisenbud Prize of the American Mathematical Society, the Nishina Memorial Prize to name a few. Uh, but one of the remarkable aspects of Hiroshi is that he is also has a strong conviction uh, to bring the excitement of science to the wider audience. Uh, and it's very uh, unique to, uh, to, uh, to have someone who has written four popular science books uh, in Japan, and these have been translated into uh, Korean and Chinese, I believe, and hopefully to English at some point, and uh, with, so that we can also uh, have access to them. Uh, and one of these uh, popular science books uh, received the Science Book Award in 2014 uh, in, um, uh, in Japan. Uh, he also writes a monthly science column in a leading magazine in Japan and with uh, several other regular columns uh, and so on. So you can see he really uh, believes in this uh, idea of communicating science. Uh, and uh, the venture into movies um, is, I think, a new one for Hiroshi uh, and being the science advisor for the movie that you are all going to see, The Man from Nine Dimensions. It, it, this has been a very successful uh, venture. Uh, the the movie has received the 2016 Best Educational Production Award from the International Planetarium Society. Uh, and the 2017, uh, um, the best feature film uh, and the best 3D show of the Immersive Film Festival in Portugal. Uh, so we, I think, have a treat in store for us today uh, as Hiroshi will first explain uh, uh, some of the science behind the movie so that we can uh, better appreciate it. I'm told it's a visual treat and I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, seeing the whole thing. And it's uh, unique, this is the first showing in India, I believe. I think even in the US, it has not been commercially uh, uh, shown. So you have all a unique opportunity to see this movie here. Uh, and uh, I, I must especially thank the Planetarium again uh, for, uh, 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 for hosting this show. Uh, and uh, I, I would also like to welcome, uh, like Dr. Pramod, uh, Mrs. Sudhamurthy and Mrs. Vishweshara. Uh, Mrs. Vishweshara, Professor Saraswati Vishweshara, uh, is the wife of uh, Professor C.V. Vishweshara, who founded the Planetarium and in whose honor we had the Vishweshara lecture uh, at ICTS a few days ago. Uh, so, um, so it's great to have uh, them as well as many of you here uh, on this occasion. So before we start the uh, show, I would like to invite Mrs. Murthy to just hand over a memento on behalf of uh, uh, ICTS to Professor Hiroshi Oguri. <laughs> so now uh, I, I let uh, Hiroshi take us through this uh, fascinating journey. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have the Indian premiere of uh, the uh, Man from the Nine Dimension. So this is a, a science uh, film, but it can be enjoyed in, at many levels. But I thought that it would be good to have uh, about a half an hour introduction about the science uh, uh, behind this movie so that when you see uh, some of the images, you can better appreciate the science behind it. So, uh, so I'm a theoretical physicist, and uh, Rajesh very kindly gave me uh, uh, some introduction. And, but I want to mention one more credential. If you know this sitcom called the Big Bang Theory, that's about grad student at Caltech. So I hope that give, that give me a credential to talk about Big Bang. And uh, so, so I'm a physicist. So, so, so physics, of course, uh, is a particular type of science 
where we start from some identifying some fundamental laws of nature and then try to derive various physical phenomena from this law. And that had led to various discoveries that improved our life. Semiconductor technology is one of them that is based on quantum mechanics. And of course, since we are in Bangalore, uh, semiconductor technology is behind all these uh, IT technology. So that has had a big impact on, on our life. But at the same time, uh, it has also spiritually uh, uh, impacted our life because uh, one of the mission of physics actually is to discover fundamental laws of nature and they use them to solve some of the deepest mystery of the universe, such as the origin and the future. And this is a question, fundamental question that has inspired human beings for uh, uh, many, many millennia. So since ancient time, uh, we have been interested in finding out how our universe began and how it works, how, why there is a, a, a sun and stars and things like that and what is our place in it. So this has, so many countries in the world have tried, people in the country try to understand this by coming up with various religions, the mythology, and those are important part of our human civilization. But our understanding, our quest to answer this kind of question have made a significant uh, jump about four centuries ago, and one of the pivotal moment was when Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope at the night sky and opened the window to the universe. And he p immediately published his result in this booklet called Starry Messenger that was published uh, uh, 1610, uh, about uh, uh, 400 years ago. And if you look open this book, you see that you have a moon. And before, before he pointed out that uh, pointed a telescope to the moon, the moon was this beautiful disk-like object, but he discovered that moon is just like our Earth. You have mountains and valleys. So, so he, and then he, he pointed the telescope to the Jupiter, and he discovered that there are four stars, satellites, uh, ro rotating around it. So again, it's like our uh, Earth and the moon. So that made a dramatic change to our understanding of the universe, because before Galilei, people thought that there is a set of law governs our activity on the earth, and there is a totally different rules for the heaven, where some of the gods and other things live. So there was, so, but what Galileo did was that perhaps there is a unification of the law on the earth and in the heaven. So that has inspired Isaac Newton to come up with this universal law of gravitation, and that became a foundation of modern science. So this was a very important moment, and that initiated scientific uh, revolution and enabled us to address some of the mystery of this universe by scientific method. So, and we have been making steady progress, and ju just like during the last 10 years, there have been several eye-opening discoveries, such as the discovery of the Higgs boson at CERN, which completed the standard model of particle physics, which I will mention later. Uh, detection of the gravitational wave, this is the front page of the Japanese newspaper, this is the front page of the New York Times. That Kip Song gave public lecture, I was told, uh, uh, last week, and uh, so this was uh, that discovery. And also the uh, precise uh, determination of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which also gave very precise understanding of the be beginning of the universe that I will talk about later. So all of these discoveries are in the past 10 years, so we have re been making remarkable progress and continue to do so now. So uh, as Rajesh kindly told, uh, mentioned that actually I have written several popular science books in Japanese, and uh, they have been actually very well received. Uh, it has sold over uh, 300,000 copies in Japan alone, and it has been translated into Chinese and Korean. So uh, one of the uh, science communicators in Miraikan, which is uh, uh, a science museum in Tokyo, so he's actually Greek, but he's very fluent in Japanese and read my book, and he wanted to make a movie about super string theory uh, 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 based, uh, based on my book. And so he came to meet me about uh, six years ago. And he says, that's a crazy idea. So, but then, then eventually I was convinced to help him because I wanted to make sure the scientific content of this is good. So, so I helped him write a proposal to this Mirai Khan, which was approved, and then we assembled the staff. 
And in fact, we got a very uh, nice group of people. So, so, so this is uh, this guy, uh, this person, Yamamoto, Mr. Yamamoto, is actually uh, one of the best visual me uh, image creator. So we will see some of his work there. And then, but we also had to identify the mo uh, movie director. And they identify this person. Uh, it's actually for a movie <laughs> director. And when uh, actually his candidacy was mentioned, I was surprised. Uh, for a movie for science. And but it turned out to be it was one of the brilliant choice because he had such a sort of interesting uh, visual image that I have never thought of. And so we will see some of his. And then, then we have some actors, and in fact, uh, one of the actress she plays a role of a scientist. Uh, she couldn't make it, but. Uh, so here is this man from nine dimension, and this is a professor that you will see, and this is a science guy. And uh, so this movie is actually an adventure of a group of scientists chasing after this mysterious man from the nine dimension. And uh, the reason we came up with this scenario was that uh, we could have make, made a, a standard science movie, but uh, he was, uh, the Dimo uh, Dimitris was very ambitious. He wanted to have uh, everything. He wanted to explain quantum mechanics in microscopic world, standard model of particle physics, Higgs. And then he also wanted to take us to the uh, universe, the galaxy, uh, from the Big Bang to the galaxy formation and the present day, and even before the uh, Big Bang to the area of inflation. And then string theory that unifies us that all in 30 minutes. So, <laughs> so how can you do that? So, so we came up with this device where th there is a group of scientists who, is, who, who are chasing after this man from nine dimension. And uh, this mis mysterious person will take us to this macroscopic, microscopic world of elementary particle and the macroscopic world of the universe and to its beginning. So that's what you will see. And uh, as Rajesh mentioned, it has gotten several awards. And I'm particularly pleased that it was selected as the best education product in a, a biannual meeting, so a meeting uh, uh, once in two years uh, by International Planetarium Society. And uh, uh, it has been shown at the various uh, uh, places, uh, starting from Premier in Tokyo, uh, Czech, uh, Athens, uh, Denver, and Norway, Portuguese. And now Hong Kong Space Museum is showing this for six months, uh, starting this month. And, uh, but I thought it'd be fun to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, science behind it. How much time do I have? Uh, maybe 20 minutes more or something, I think. That's, that's reasonable. And uh, so, as we have learned that uh, uh, in the, uh, by the research in the past couple of decades that the universe was born in 13.8 billion years ago. Now, the very fact that we know the age of the universe in three significant di digits it's pretty amazing. When I was a grad student, actually, uh, astronomers were not very able to uh, was not able to measure the age of the universe as well as this, and there were there were disagreement by the factor of two. And some of the estimate in the, some of the estimates, the age of the universe was actually younger than some of the galaxies in it, and that cannot happen. So there was something wrong. But now we have like uh, age of the universe in three digits, so that's pretty amazing. And uh, in fact, the Modern understanding of this scenario started with Einstein's uh, construction of general relativity. So he completed his theory of general relativity, his theory of gravity, and immediately he's very ambitious, so immediately applied it to the whole universe. And then he discovered that universe in, in his theory was expanding. And he thought for some reason that cannot be the case, so he abandoned the solution. But it turns out that uh, 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 14, uh, 14 years later, Edwin Hubble, uh, who is actually at, in Pasadena, where my university is, at Mount Wilson, discovers that the universe is expanding. So this is Einstein with Hubble uh, at this t his telescope. Well, I can clearly see that this, this photo is staged. Because first of all, Einstein is not an astronomer. And, uh, the, the expansion of the universe was measured by the Doppler shift of the color of the galaxy, so you cannot see in the, in the kind of naked eye. More importantly, Hubble is an astronomer, and he knows damn well that you shouldn't smoke near the, <laughs> near the telescope. <laughs> so anyway, so, so, so I went, uh, recently I went to Oxford University and found that uh, actually they preserved the blackboard of Einstein, 
where he actually writes down the, the formula related to the expansion of the universe. So by this time, he realized that, well, he made a dis mistake by abandoning his original solution. Otherwise, he could have predicted it and then confirmed. So, uh, after, so we actually have a very accurate picture of how the universe was, uh, was at a very early stage. So three minutes after the birth, uh, we know that the protons and neutrons combine to make helium and hydrogen. And then George Gamow and his collaborator actually made a precise calculation based on this hypothesis and predicted that at the present day, the ratio of hydrogen and helium has to be 12 to 1. And this precisely agreed with the measurement. So this is actually the second prediction and confirmation of the prediction of the Big Bang theory. One was the expansion of the universe, and second was the ratio of hydrogen and helium. Uh, by the way, uh, during this presentation, I used some of the picture that you will see in the movie, so that you can, you can identify what you see here and what you will see during the film presentation. Okay? And after uh, uh, 400,000 years, so we jump from three minutes to 400,000 years. The, before that, the universe was very hot and dense. So electrons and uh, 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 atomic uh, atom were composed of, uh, is composed of atomic nuclei and ele electrons. But the universe was so hot and dense, so they were separated, and it was like a plasma. So the light couldn't go straight within the plasma. But after 400,000 years, that uh, they actually began to form atoms. So those are neutral, so light can go straight. So that's where, th from th that's the that's that's state of the universe that we can actually observe now. Because the first light coming from the uh, universe was, th this light came from 400,000 years after the birth of the universe. And this was actually detected. So, so 1964, Penzias and Wilson detected this very much primordial light using this device. And they got Nobel Prize for it. There are lots of interesting stories behind it. But in view of time, uh, let me uh, cut to the chase. And uh, so after this era, you start, so now here you have 100 million years after the beginning of the universe. Now after this universe become this neutral, electrically neutral, and light start propag propagating freely, what's going to happen? What happened? Well, the universe consists of helium and uh, 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 helium and uh, uh, hydrogen atoms, those are both neutral and the light, but the universe expands and it becomes gradually very low temperature, uh, uh, cold and uh, 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 dilute, and uh, so, so then, then it becomes very boring place. And in fact, astronomers call this as dark age of the universe. So the universe becomes gradually very, very cold, nothing happened. So if it was like that, then we wouldn't be here to talk about the universe, right? So, so it just was become very, very a boring place. So, but fortunately, there was some small clump of mass here and there, and eventually they started to attract those atoms and uh, start forming some kind of structure. And uh, that was sort of seed that became the universe, uh, that became the stars and galaxies that we see now. So those things started happening about 100 uh, uh, million years after the birth of the universe. And then uh, the, the fir first uh, star was created. And we, start, we are now starting to observe some of these first stars in the universe. And then uh, by the time you get to the billion years later, the galaxy started forming. So as I said, uh, we will we'll see all these pictures uh, during the presentation. But in the film, we'll see this in backward. So we'll start with our present age universe and then go backward towards the Big Bang. I'm going now forward in the logical order. But you'll see at the bottom of this picture, you'll see some universal clock, which tells you precisely which year it is, so you can keep track of it. I should also mention that all these images are not made up. They are based on a very precise numerical simulation uh, conducted a group called the uh, uh, Illustrious Simulation Group of Harvard Smithsonian uh, Astronomical so uh, uh, Center and MIT and other groups. So, so actually I visited them and uh, they actually helped me, uh, they actually uh, provided us their code. 
So our film is actually based on the uh, precise numerical simulation of how the structure of the universe was formed. And then uh, nine billion years later, the sun and the earth formed. And so, so, so we have went through this tour of the universe. The universe gave us a home on this beautiful planet. Uh, and it gave us a long time to evolve, 3.5 billion years to evolve from microbes to homo sapiens. And they are now intelligent enough to ask, how does the universe work? Isn't that miraculous that uh, such things can happen? So, so natural question is that why is the universe the way it is that made it possible for us to exist and ask such profound question? And how did it come to such existence? So, that, so to answer this question, uh, we need to, so we started out this, I started this presentation three minutes after the Big Bang or beginning of the universe. But we want to go back to the Big Bang and ask how things was like before then. So, so just to remind you that three minutes after the birth, the universe was made of proton and neutron that combined into hydrogen and helium, and that led to the prediction that was confirmed. But if you go ba backward, if you b go to even earlier universe, the universe was hot and dense, so the, uh, the atom decomposed into proton and neutron, and even protons and neutrons are made of quarks, which you see in the film. And uh, they, they now fall apart into qu these uh, constituent quarks. You can even go backwards, there are like 11 zeros over here. And it's amazing that we can actually give a precise prediction of how the universe was like. Uh, this, I cannot even read it. Uh, 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 0 0.00000000001 second after the birth. And uh, based on the standard model of particle physics, uh, which is the theory of elementary particle, which has been actually tested uh, in many ways that you will see uh, in the film. And in the film, we will see some of the features of this uh, uh, standard model of particle physics and uh, some of its players. One of the important players of standard model is a neutrinos. And uh, uh, actually, this is a, a photograph of uh, Kajita, who is actually my colleague in Japanese institution, uh, who got Nobel Prize for his uh, discovery of what is called the neutrino oscillation. Which is that there are actually three different types of neutrinos. And as, the, as the neutrino travel, they change its, its types. It's called uh, flavor changing. And in the film, actually, we present this kind of uh, uh, flavor changing of neutrino. Uh, by changing the color of neutrinos. You'll see that neutrino falling from the sky, and then as it falls down, it changes the color. So that was sort of uh, re to represent the neutrino and uh, its effect of changing of flavors, called neutrino oscillation. And we have photons in the uh, standard model of particles. And Higgs is another uh, particle whose discovery led to the Nobel Prize. And uh, Higgs is a particularly important particle in uh, a standard model. Uh, which give mass to all the elementary particles. So you have these 17 elementary particles that uh, explain the standard model of particle physics. And using that, we have very pretty accurate picture of how universe was like in this 0 0.00000000001 second after its, big, uh, its birth. But of course, scientists are like kids, and uh, you, you, you never satisfy kids. You, uh, you explain something to kids, and then they say, then what was that before, and what was that before? And we are like that, so, so we want to know what, how the universe was like before that. So, so to answer this question, we need more fundamental theory. So standard model of particle physics is established, it's, it's, written, it's mathematically consistent, and experimentally verified. But uh, we need, it is not sufficient to go beyond this, uh, this time. And in fact, there are, we have reason to, to th believe that the standard model is not complete. By the observation of the universe, we know that, in fact, standard model only explains 4% of all the energy in the universe. Five times more, you have things called dark matter. And in fact, 74% uh, uh, of the whole universe is made of this mysterious thing called dark energy that we don't know about. So uh, standard model of particle physics explained only this part. Fortunately, until this time, almost everything can be explained by, by this kind of matter. But if you, if you want to understand the universe before that, 
you start needing to understand the rest of the universe. And we still don't have a complete theory for that, but one of the possibilities is called cosmic inflation, which uh, you will see uh, towards the second half of the film. Uh, what happens is that in, the, uh, in this very early universe, so there are, I, th I think, 36 zeros over here, uh, the universe was so small and dense, so the law of uh, microscopic world, that is quantum mechanics, and the law of macroscopic world, which is Einstein's general relativity, has to be combined. So this, this kind of picture you will see in the film represent the fluctuation of space and time in the quantum mechanical world. And uh, so this is what you will see in this inflationary era. So the force and the matter and even space and time of the universe were fluctuating according to the law of quantum mechanics. Now, this sounds outrageous, but this prediction of such theory has been confirmed experimentally. So, so this is one of the pictures I showed you at the one of the development in the past decade. And this provided the evidence for quantum fluctuation of matter during the cosmic inflation. And those are actually observed. These kind of fluctuations are exactly the signature of quantum mechanical fluctuation in this early universe. And, but in fact, this, and, and moreover, these fluctuations are important. So, so I mentioned that uh, about uh, a million, 100 million years after the Big Bang, the universe, which was like in the dark age, which is very cold and flat, start making structures that became stars and galaxies and eventually us. And those seeds of this structure formation were planted by this uh, uh, fluctuation of this cosmic radiation background. And these are made by the quantum fluctuation. So in some sense, we are all made of quantum fluctuation in this kind of early universe. Uh, but this is actually not sufficient for confirmation of inflation. And in fact, in order to actually say that inflation did happen for sure, we also need to measure, we also need to detect the evidence for fluctuation of the space and time. And one of the sure uh, uh, way to verify this is to detect the gravitational wave coming from such fluctuation directly. So my friend in Japan has this project called Light Bird Satellite, which flies a satellite and which actually measures the gravitational waves from a primordial universe directly. So, of course, uh, you, you, some of you heard the public lecture by Kip Song uh, uh, last week, and the LIGO's detection of gravitational wave opened a new window to the universe, and uh, as I said, such uh, uh, gravitational wave detection may also uh, help us solve the mystery of the early universe. I understand that uh, India is now joining LIGO, and uh, uh, so that, that, that network of things uh, would eventually uh, help us um, uncover uh, those mystery, and of course uh, those people got Nobel Prize for their initiative. So, so as I said, to understand the early universe, we need a more fundamental theory that unified the microscopic world of gravity with uh, uh, the macroscopic world of gravity with the microscopic world of quantum mechanics. And the only consistent way we know how to do this is a super string theory, and that's one of the theory, that, uh, that's one of the reasons we study string theory, and uh, this is also studied very uh, intensively at uh, this uh, Rajesh Institute, the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, uh, here. So, uh, string theory postulates that fundamental building blocks are not point particle. So, in the standard model of particle physics, people postulate that all the particles are actually, as the name suggests, point like object. But in string theory, we postulate that they are actually made of this kind of extended object. And string theory is defined in 9 plus 1 space-time dimension, 9 space, um, I was almost running out of symbols, and time. Of course, we live in 3 plus 1 dimension, so at least we feel so. So we have to deal with what to do with 9 dimension. This also poses the challenge of making film about 9 dimension. How you, can you explain 9 dimension? using two-dimensional surface. So you will see some of our attempts in the film. Uh, so, but in the actual world, we believe that this extra six dimension, so namely nine minus three, uh, is made into small compact Carabial manifold. Uh, with this, shape, this is actually the shape of Carabial manifold. You see, if you project this six-dimensional object into two-dimensional surface, 
and but it's so small that it is not visible to us directly. But in fact, the rich structure of particle physics, such as 17 type of elementary particles, Higgs bosons, and all these mysterious forces, all emerges from the geometry of Calabria manifold. So if you uncover the mystery of Calabria manifold, you, can, you may be able to explain such feature of uh, theory of elementary particles. So what we want to do, and what I have been doing also, is to derive quantitative prediction of physics of this our three plus one dimensional world from the geometry of this Calabria manifold. But there are lots of pr uh, problems, one of which is that actually the geometry of Calabria is so complicated. So we, we, we cannot even measure the, we cannot have a f mathematical formula to measure the distance between the two points in Calabria manifold. So how can you do that without that? So, so one of the things that actually I, I have done in my career was to come up with mathematical method to overcome some of these dif difficulties. So in the film, we also me uh, mentioned some of the power of mathematics. And uh, toward the end, the, 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 the true nature of uh, the man from nine dimension will be revealed. And uh, some of the formulas that showed up was actually, I wrote it down, so you will find out what these are. So anyway, so this film, ma the man from nine dimension. So this, this you can ask. You, I was asked, what, what is this man? But this is actually the metaphor for theory of everything, which unifies the macroscopic world of gravity with the microscopic world of quantum mechanics. And our our quest to discover it is still continuing. And so I hope you will see some uh, glimpse of some of that in the film. So so I hope you enjoy it. And we'll have questions after the film. Thank you. You can see why it got all the best uh, in the Immersive Film Festival, the best movie show. I'd like to Thank congratulate you Hiroshi <laughs> again for a, a wonderful. Well, I'm uh, happy to know you enjoyed it. So uh, yeah, I think this was a privilege for all of us to be able to be the first people in India to uh, to watch this truly marvelous movie. So, uh, will uh, Professor Guri has kindly agreed to take a few questions? It's late already; we can't go on for very long. So, as I said, please. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming. Yes, so he asked what it means to project higher dimension to a lower dimension. In the movie, you have seen Karabiao, just like a pet dog following the man <laughs> from nine dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these pictures are actually r uh, based on the accurate mathematical formula of Karabiao manifold. Karabiao manifold is in six dimension, so you cannot see it, and it's challenging to project onto the two-dimensional screen. But the name projection suggests you can see some feature of higher dimensional object by projecting into lower dimension. And in fact, picture itself is like that. So when you take photograph, two-dimensional photograph, it's part of this three-dimensional object, but as seen from one direction. So you have a pixel coming, uh, you have light coming out from one direction, and then your pixel of your uh, camera captures them in one aspect of it. So for example, this object is a water bottle. If you see it from this side, it's elongated vertically. But if you see it this way, it's circular. So depending on which direction you look at, you see different feature. But if you see all of these directions, then you can reconstruct this three-dimensional structure. So the way we understand the Karabiao is also like that. You can project this six-dimensional object by looking at it in various different directions project onto two-dimensional surface. And in fact, the picture that the in the movie, Karabiao changes the shape. The, the way it comes out is that uh, you are actually projecting it from different for different two-dimensional surfaces. So you can see that from the film, you can see various, the same Karabiao manifold projected in different features. OK, there's a question here. That's certainly true. And moreover, uh, LHC uh, haven't found any supersymmetry. That's correct. So how would you help me to like, to try to persuade them? <laughs> OK, well, first of all, uh, there, is no uh, there is no need for persuasion. 
<laughs> the science progress by the uh, economy of free market. So <laughs> scientists are trained to understand what's interesting and what's not interesting. And people work, we cannot force people to work on particular areas. It is certainly true that uh, uh, string theory has not had experimental confirmation. And uh, in fact, when we make the movie, I want to make sure that that distinction is made between theories that has been experimentally verified and theories that are in, uh, in the stage of hypothesis. When the professor comes and explains the string theory, he says that it's still a hypothesis, hypothesis. so he yes. makes it very clear, and this has been repeated a few times. Science is uh, experimental science. Uh, science is an experimental endeavor. So you postulate sci uh, theory, and then it has to be experimentally verified. But sometimes the, the time difference between the postulate and the verification takes a long time. And often you never know how long it's going to take. The gravitational wave took 100 years to be verified. But it's eventually verified and opened the window to the universe. If people gave up on the idea of gravitational wave, this would have never happened. Atomic theory was postulated 4,000 years ago in Greece or somewhere, 2,000 years ago at least. And, uh, but uh, but it, took, it took thousands of years to be verified. Uh, it is my hope that superstring theory will be verified more earlier, but this is not something you never know. But so string theory is uh, 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 proposed based on known verified fact. And it is the only non-mathematically consistent framework to understand it. So it's worthwhile to study, and that's why some of us study them. Uh, there are many possible windows within the next 10 years or so for prediction of string theory to be confronted by experiment. Uh, the LHC was certainly one of the avenues, but it was not really the uh, regime of energy that's appropriate for testing the prediction of a string theory. So even if uh, LHC discovered supersymmetry, it would not have been the verification of a string theory itself. It would have been provided an interesting hint to string theory. There are other avenues. One uh, inter interesting avenue is a neutrino physics, where the pre precise measurement of mass of neutrinos and some of the uh, neutrino oscillation angle can lead us to understand the new uh, uh, mass energy scale called the ground unification scale based on what's called the seesaw mechanism. That's another interesting avenue to have a glimpse to higher energy. The, the uh, precision measurement of early universe is yet another exciting avenue where in the next decade or so, uh, I show one of the proposed experiments by my Japanese friend, the light bird, which is supposed to measure the primordial gravitational waves. And those can, lead to the, uh, uh, th those can be helped to sharpen or even falsify the cosmic inflation model. And those would inform us the uh, 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 a way that we can test uh, string theory by experiment. So uh, there are many avenues that we should explore. We are, of course, limited by technology and funding, so there is so much we can do. But string theory, uh, the, the progress of string theory is such that it has been inspiring many uh, scientists or would-be scientists. And uh, so it's, it's a very important part of the whole landscape of uh, physical science research, I think. Thank you, Hiroshi. Uh, maybe we'll take a couple more questions. Uh, yes, please. What led to Big Bang? What what led to Big Bang? Yeah. Okay. So you had uh, two questions. One is that what motivates Big Bang theory? And another question is that are all the four, are all the four forces of nature, is that all or is there anything more? Would that help Big Bang theory? Let me answer them in turn, okay? So, so in my lecture, uh, I gave three reasons that we believe sub, uh, a Big Bang theory exists. It was not obvious a priori that Big Bang theory existed. In fact, uh, uh, there were a group of scientists who actually believe that the universe is steady that the universe existed from infinite past to infinite future. And in fact, Big Bang theory was actually a derogatory term, beginning, in, uh, made up by this group of people. Uh, uh, and uh, 
they didn't like Big Bang theory, the, the theory that the universe at the beginning, beginning. So they said that, oh, they, they, they have a group of people who believe that the universe started with Bang. So that was sort of uh, uh, the beginning of this terminology which got stuck, like Obamacare. People didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be a derogatory, ta derogatory term, but it got stuck and I got a mi good meaning to it. <laughs> so, so sorry for the political intrusion. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, so, so one of the reasons one of the reason we believe was exactly the reason Einstein be believed. That is that Hubble observed the night sky and see that uh, galaxies were receding. And it was receding exactly in such a way that the further you go, it's going much faster. And the one very clean mathematical explanation for this phenomenon was that the universe was expanding. I'm sorry. <laughs> expanding so that it hit, hit the radiation's head. <laughs> but then if that was Galaxy. the case, then if you, if, you, uh, change it, if you actually go backward in time, then the universe must have been contracting. And then, then, you, then if so, then since the density of the, the, that means that the universe density of the universe must have become higher and higher, the temperature must have gone uh, higher and higher. So there must be have been so th that it would naturally natural to expect that uh, there must have been a uh, time in the universe where the universe was very dense and hot. So that's the era called the Big Bang. So that's one of the reasons we believe the Big Bang. There are a couple of other reasons we, I, I presented. One was the prediction of the ratio of hydrogen and uh, helium. That was precisely the way that the uh, 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 Big Bang model predicted. And there are more recent uh, observations of, of cosmic microwave background radiation, which is uh, the first light that the universe emitted. So we have, we have s now several very high precision uh, measurement of the universe that all leads to the Big Bang theory. So that's one reason. Now you ask, well, so separate question, which is that in the standard model of particle physics, you have 17 elementary particles, and some of which actually mediate the force between matters. One is called uh, weak interaction. Well, first of all, we have uh, electromagnetic interaction, which is the most familiar one, which is responsible for how the magnet attract iron, for example, or how, how the electricity works. So those are, uh, co are called electromagnetism. That's one type of force mediated by photon, which appeared in the movie. And then there are a weak interaction, which is responsible for radioactive properties of some of the matters. And then there is a strong force that combines quarks into protons and neutrons. So a, a standard model particle has three forces, and you have one more force, which is uh, gravity. But we don't believe that uh, 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 element, uh, the standard model particle physics is uh, the complete one, and there can be other forces. There are many uh, uh, sort of hypotheses which have not been experimentally verified, but that predict those things. One of which is a fo new force that is created by particle called, uh, uh, mediated by co particle called action. So action is a hypothetical elementary particle and it turns out that this also provides a very good candidate for dark matter, which exists in, in the universe. We know five times more than the standard model particles. So that's one uh, possible candidate. And that's not only ex uh, add one more force to the nature, but that can explain the dark matter in the universe and then may tell us about the feature of the universe before this Big Bang era. So in, in, indeed, there are, uh, uh, we believe that uh, the four force of matter, uh, nature, uh, four, four, four types of force is not complete. There must be more forces that we are yet to discover. But uh, we have not, so there are many possible ideas that theorists have been speculating, but uh, we have not yet, those have not been experimentally verified. But if we can verify the, any of them, as if any of them are confirmed, that could be, u that could be used for us to understand dark matter and dark, dark energy of the current universe and also the state of the universe before the 0 0.00000001 <laughs> second af after the Big Bang. So both of these are very good questions. Thank you for asking. Okay, the, there's one question, the final question, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, so you ask, uh, so uh, are there example 
where six dimensional objects interact with our three dimensional objects. Now, so, so I mentioned th uh, uh, three dim uh, six dimension and uh, three dimension, but it's not like you have a separate space. So, so it's, it's more like, so in the movie, we are, we are trying to, we try to explain this concept that there is an extra world. So we had, we had a like brainstorming session of how we could possibly explain the notion of six dimension for broad range of audience in the movie in 30 minutes. So the idea we came up with was that we started out with two dimensions. And we, the films are already, sh always, almost always, well, unless you have a three dimensional movie, almost always shows in two dimensional surface, right? So, wh but when you are looking at it, you start feel like you are, you, you are seeing the, the three dimensional phenomena. And suddenly, this, the man from nine dimension comes out from this uh, six, uh, six two dimensional film. And then, in the actual, if you have a, th this movie has a 3D version, and if you wear these things, it actually the demand from nine dimension comes out to extra dimension. But these poor scientists are stuck in two dimension. So these are meant to be metaphor of two, three dimensional world of us and nine dimensional world of super string theory. So you, it's not like you have extra six dimension, but it's a possibility that from our three dimension, you can go out to extra dimension. Just like if you are, if you are stuck in two dimension, there is actually a very nice uh, novel from 19th century British uh, uh, England uh, during the time of Victorian era called Flatland. Some of you might have read it, where this is about a world in two dimension, and then there is a, uh, there is a person called Square, the shape in two dimension, and uh, one day he encountered a sphere in three dimensions. So this might be a metaphor of how two dim uh, three dimensional person can in uh, interact with six dimensional person. So one day, Mr. Square was walking on the street and then suddenly see some point in front of you. And then this point expand, become a circle. In this, in this world of two dimension, the more side you have, you are hierarchically better. This is a Victorian era novel, so this was <laughs> meant to be the uh, hierarchy, so the, the Victorian era of uh, uh, British England was very hierarchical. So three dimension, the, so the, 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 the uh, triangle is the lowest <laughs> in the hierarchy. Square is like a middle class guy. And then you have uh, pentagon and hexagon, and uh, these are like aristocrat. And the circle is the highest in the hierarchy. So, so you, 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 Mr. Square is walking, and then you see a point expanding circle, and he says, oh, this guy is a very important person. <laughs> and then, but they expand, and then they contract and disappear. He didn't know what happened. What happened was that in this flat land, three-dimensional circle just closed it. So that's how the, it would look like for this, for this uh, flat, flat surface person. So then you can ask, well, so six dimension is a little bit difficult to explain. But suppose there is one more extra dimension, four dimension. And then suppose there, there is a four dimensional sphere. Suppose that four dimensional sphere visits us. How, do it, how it would look like? Well, you have a point coming out in front of you. Suddenly it expands into sphere and expand, And they shrink, point, and disappear. Right? So, so when you go home tonight and walking toward your home, Something, if something <laughs> like that happens, you know that the four-dimensional sphere visited <laughs> you. So pay attention to it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Hiroshi. That was fascinating. And uh, I'm sure all of you, when you go home and walk, yeah. you, uh, you, you <laughs> watch out four-dimensional sphere. <laughs> yeah, you will definitely have the imagination now to see these extra dimensions. Uh, so uh, let me thank, uh, thank Hiroshi once again for both his lecture and for uh, bringing the movie to India for us to see. Thank you very uh, much. And uh, uh, so have a nice evening and hope to see you at other ICTS events. Uh, there is a copy with curiosity next Sunday on black holes. So uh, that will also be another fascinating uh, 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 talk. It will be in the auditorium uh, downstairs. So see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.